everyone and welcome. It's my pleasure today to introduce this webinar that combines two topics that I am particularly passionate about, wraparound and peer support. So I'm looking forward to this presentation and to the discussion afterwards. Next slide, please. Before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge the various organizations that have made this work possible. The webinar is a collaboration between the Research and Training Center on Pathways to Positive Futures, or Pathways RTC for short, that's located at Portland State University in Oregon, and the National TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health at the University of Maryland. Both of these are funded by SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and NIDLER, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Both of these are part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Next, please. So my name is Janet Walker. I use she, her pronouns. I am a research professor at Portland State University and director of Pathways Research and Training Center. I'm also co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative. And our main presenters today are Caitlin Baird and Maria Hermson Kritz, and I will let them introduce themselves now. Hi everybody, my name is Caitlin Baird. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a project director and trainer with the Pathways Research and Training Center at Portland State University. I work closely with Janet and Maria on projects dedicated to youth-driven practice, using young adult mental health, and youth peer support. Prior to my time at Pathways Research and Training Center, I was a youth peer support partner for young people in wraparounds and worked closely with family partners and care coordinators in order to serve youth and families. I was also a supervisor for youth peer support specialists in wraparound and drop-in center settings. In addition to that, I was a wraparound and systems of care trainer across the state of Oregon, and I also currently do consultation on youth partner work within wraparound in states who are starting to do youth partner work. I use my lived experience in order to inform the work that I do as somebody who was uh, involved in both the mental health and justice systems as a youth. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Maria Hermson Chris. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Hermson Kritz and I'm a research assistant at Pathways to Positive Futures Research and Training Center at Portland State University. And I work with Caitlin and Janet. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, prior to working at Pathways, I was a youth peer support specialist and I also supervised other youth peer support specialists working with transition age youth and running a drop-in center for transition age youth many of whom were involved in the wraparound process. Um, I also have my own lived experience in the youth mental health system, and I bring that to my work as well. We'll do an overview of our practice. We'll go over a few scenarios that for Carrie and Jane, as well as Emily and Sarah. All the scenarios that we review today are based off of real life experiences. However, names have been changed in order for, to protect the privacy of those that we are talking about. We'll then talk about some common challenges and strategies, and we'll wrap up with any questions that you may have. Here are our learning objectives for today. As the two peer providers on the wraparound team, the youth partner and the family partner have a good deal of crossover in their role descriptions. As many may know, the youth partner and the family partner are specifically assigned to the youth member and the family member who are part of the wraparound process, and their role is to help bring the voice of the youth and family to the team, particularly when the team has many a professional. When working with families, that there might exist some strife or some tension between the youth and their parents. This is fairly common. The youth and the family partner might feel that their role has put them at odds, but in actuality, they have a, a lot of flexibility in order to work together and help the youth and family members see each other's perspectives. In order to specify some of this work, we have identified several common challenges, as well as the potential for common collaboration between the youth partner and the family partner. Some themes that we will emphasize today include proactivity and preparation. Uh, 
Okay, so before we begin, we're going to start off with a scenario to help us kind of center some of the questions we want to look at. And our first scenario is around Carrie, she, her, and Jane, who also uses she, her. Um, well, I need to pull it up. Okay, so Carrie, 17 years old, and her mother, Jane, have been participating in the wraparound process for four months. Carrie was recently assigned a youth partner, and Jane has had a family partner since the start of the wraparound process. When Carrie first met with her youth partner, she expressed that she wants to move out of her mom's house because all they do is fight, and she does better in school with, and with her mental health when she is not living at home. She suggested moving in with her aunt, Beth. The youth partner asked Carrie if she had spoken with her family about this, and Carrie shared that while she has already sought Beth's approval, she had not shared this with her mom for fear of retaliation. In the past, when Carrie brought up such strategies to her mom, Jane cut off her access to her phone and internet, which Carrie says she needs to complete her schoolwork. Carrie's youth partner asked if Carrie would like to talk about her hopes to move out of her mom's house at her upcoming wraparound meeting, and Carrie responded yes. Carrie's youth partner supported Carrie in planning to share her agenda item with her team facilitator and helped her anticipate what her mom and other team members might say. The day of the meeting, Carrie and her youth partner arrive early, shortly before Jane and her family partner do. As they sit in the meeting room together, waiting for the rest of the team to arrive, Jane asks Carrie why she didn't come home last night. Carrie states that she was at Beth's house doing homework and fell asleep. The rest of the team arrives and the meeting begins. The first life domain the team focuses on, at the request of both Carrie and Jane, is living, and it is clear that Carrie and Jane are in disagreement. Carrie wants to move in with her Aunt Beth, and Jane wants Carrie to stay at home. Both of them contend that the other strategy is non-negotiable. The meeting ends with no resolution. Okay, so some questions to consider when we look at this scenario. What are some things that the youth and family partner could have done before the meeting to help the process go more smoothly? And then now that the meeting is over, what can the family partner or youth partner do to help resolve this conflict? So first, we really want to emphasize that best practices would be that a youth partner and a family partner would have been present on the team really from the beginning of the wraparound process. This could really help both Carrie and Jane um, advocate for themselves from the beginning. So one thing that the youth partner could have done to help the situation maybe have gone a little bit more smoothly would be to help Carrie anticipate the situation at the team meeting. She could have done this by asking some open-ended questions like, how do you think your mother will respond and how can we best communicate this plan to your mom? Things like that. Um, she might have also shared some of her own lived experience around maybe your own relationship with her mother or her own living situation at that time, if relevant. And then if by having these conversations with uh, Carrie, Carrie might have decided that, okay, maybe my mom's going to react a little bit better to my plan if I do bring this up with her before the meeting and don't spring it on her in the meeting. Then she can support Carrie in deciding how she wants to communicate her plan to her mother prior to the meeting, um, what kind of support she needs to do so, and maybe practicing doing so if she wants to. So this brings us to our first strategy for collaboration, which is promoting positive and proactive collaboration. So sometimes a young person might do or plan to do something that is contrary to their parents' wishes. And when this happens, the youth partner can help preempt conflict by exploring consequences with the young person and supporting them to communicate their decision to their parent if they choose to do so. At times, the youth partner might also want to talk to the family partner about how they are helping the young person work on positive com communication with their parent. Um, and this would be, of course, done with the youth's permission. The family partner can also be doing the same thing with the youth's parent, uh, working on how to positively communicate 
with their young person. Additionally, when the youth partner anticipates the topic the youth is intending to bring up at the meeting might be contentious like this one, they should support the young person to communicate this with their parent before the meeting to minimize conflict using these same kind of positive communication strategies. Usually the youth partner and family partner will work with the youth and family member individually on these effective communication strategies, but they might all decide to meet together if the youth and our family prefers to do so. So some other strategies that might have been used, um, the youth partner might have asked Carrie's permission to share her agenda item with the family partner. Um, when doing this, it would be important for the youth partner to clarify their reason for wanting to do so, um, really explaining to Carrie that why they think this will be helpful, um, explaining exactly what they are going to be sharing and exactly what they're not going to be sharing, that this is really going to be limited to uh, just this agenda item and no personal information that Carrie doesn't want shared with the family partner or their mother. And then by doing this, then the family partner can really help better prepare Jane to receive this information at the meeting and work on those positive and proactive communication skills. Okay, so this brings us to our second key to collaboration, which is keeping it confidential. So sometimes it might be valuable for the youth partner to share the youth's perspective on particular goals, circumstances, crisis events, etc., with the family partner on their wraparound team. Um, so while this kind of collaboration can lead to solutions like the discovery of natural supports, ideas for crisis plans, and common ground, the youth and the parent may share is crucial that no point is the youth partner sharing confidential information about the youth with the family partner. If the youth partner feels that it would be beneficial to share information with the family partner, they should explain to the youth exactly what they want to share and why they want to share it and make sure that the youth is comfortable with this plan moving forward. Okay, so some strategies to preempt conflict in this is checking in also with the care coordinator prior to the meeting so that the care coordinator can be better prepared to manage any tension or conflict. Um, I really want to highlight, I think, that preparation is almost as important, if not more important, to, for the team meeting to go smoothly than the actual strategies used in the team meeting itself sometimes. And family partners and youth partners can really work together in order to prepare families and youth for what is going to be talked about and how we can communicate about such effectively. Something really quick that I would like to highlight that we should have mentioned in the beginning is that this PowerPoint and the document that this is based off of was written by a peer support specialist. Um, and as you may notice, that the perspective is sort of a youth-centered, and that's because the experience that Maria and I is both as a youth and peer support specialists and youth partners. That said, we did collaborate heavily with family partners who were able to provide input and help edit the document. So I just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. So back to strategies to resolving the conflict. In working with Carrie and Jane to reflect on what happened and prepare for the next meeting, the youth partner and the family partner will talk with them about what it is that they want to see go differently so that we can support positive and proactive communication in between meetings and during meetings. So for instance, the youth partner might ask Carrie questions like, how do you feel like the meeting went? What do you think that made it go poorly? When you have good meetings, what makes them go well? And what do you think we can do to better help it, uh, to help your next meeting go better? So you'll notice that these are things where the youth partner isn't directly telling Carrie what to do, just as the family partner shouldn't directly tell Jane what to do. We are actively using open-ended questions to elicit their experience and really help them identify what is going to make things go well for them, both in the meeting and in between the meetings. And then of course we can share lived experience as it may be relevant. I know that for me, it was very important to share my lived experience with young people when I was working with them, when they felt like there was irresolvable conflict with their families. Um, and I've worked with a number of family partners who have done the same thing as they're working with parents. 
So I've been able to share my experience as somebody who experienced conflict with my family as a young adult and as a youth. Um, and family partners were often able to share with parents a little bit about how they might have handled their young person becoming more independent and maybe becoming a little bit more rebellious or not always agreeing with them. Okay, so strategy number three is providing perspectives. This is a really crucial one because it really helps youth and family members understand where each other are coming from. So oftentimes when the youth and their parents are encountering conflict, it's because they're just not seeing eye to eye or it's understanding each other's perspective. In this circumstance, it can be helpful for the youth peer support partner to share a bit of their lived experience with the family partner, and then the family partner can relay that to the family member as appropriate. For example, if a young person is resistant to going to psychiatric residential treatment, perhaps the youth partner will share their own experiences in a residential treatment center in order to help the parent understand why being admitted to a residential facility might be frightening for a young person. Learning some of the youth partner's story as it relates to that of their child might help the parent better contextualize their young person's perspectives and their behaviors. So some strategies for resolving any conflict is it going to be working on a plan for the next meeting, and then perhaps that the youth and family partner meet together with the care coordinator so that everyone is on the same page. Again, really being able to do some of that preparation in order to preempt conflict is going to be really important. And I know that something that was really helpful for me was working with family partners about sort of what uh, um, some risks might be that are happening in the home so that we can help prepare the youth and the family to talk about that at their next meeting if they're experiencing disagreement. Okay, so we are coming to our second scenario. So this one is dealing with Emily and her mother, Sarah. So I'm going to read it again, and you can also find the whole thing written out on our tip sheet. I can't remember what we're calling it, that we shared with you, and the link is also on our Pathways website. So Emily is 17 years old and has a boyfriend whom her mother, Sarah, does not approve of. Sarah and Emily frequently butt heads over Emily's dating life, friends, etc., because Emily has spent time with unsafe people in the past. Sarah often reacts in anger when she learns that Emily has a social life, and because of this, Emily is not open with her mother about such. While Emily has displayed risky behaviors in the past, since she began her work in the wraparound process and was assigned a youth partner, her judgment has significantly improved. She is working on her identified goals of getting her GED and finding a job and has demonstrated use of her coping skills. While Sarah acknowledges this, she is still understandably apprehensive and does not want Emily to engage in social activities. Emily approached her youth partner about accessing birth control from Planned Parenthood. Emily knew she could already access such on her own and without parental consent, but wanted her youth partner to join her as a supportive young adult. The youth partner agreed, and Emily asked that the youth partner not share this information with her mother or any other wraparound team members. The youth partner agreed and helped Emily explore the consequences of her mother finding out that she obtained birth control. Emily still advocated that she did not want her mother or other team members to know. In the meantime, Sarah discovered Emily's birth control, and she decided she wanted to discuss such at the next wraparound team meeting. Sarah was very upset and felt that the youth partner should have denied Emily's request for support and reported the attempt to her team. During the meeting, the youth partner explained their role that Emily could access birth control despite her support, but this was not a matter that related to the wraparound process, and that she would not share information Emily asked be confidential, unless there is a safety concern. The family partner normalized Sarah's feelings and provided some perspective from her own experience, while validating the youth partner's explanation of their role. So let's look at some of the successful strategies that were used by the youth and family partner in this situation. 
So you partner did a good job of using one of the collaboration strategies we highlighted earlier, which was keeping it confidential, right? So Emily had asked that she not share any of this information with the wraparound team, and the youth partner honored that. Um, she worked with her to kind of anticipate the situation. Okay, what will happen if your mother finds out about this? Um, how will she feel if she learns that you hid this from her? Um, but when Emily, you know, stood her ground and considered those consequences and still wanted to keep this private, um, the youth partner honored this and um, kind of maintained her ground. Another important thing that the youth partner did at the wraparound team meeting is clarified their role as a youth peer sport specialist. And that is going to be another one of our keys to collaboration for both youth and family partners. Which is clarifying the role. So um, it's important that youth and family partners clearly explain their role really from the beginning of the wraparound process, but also when challenges kind of like this one arise. Um, so youth partners should emphasize from the beginning that it's really their role to help the youth advocate for themselves and bring their voice to the planning process. And sometimes the ideas and perspectives that youth bring up might clash with those that their parents bring up and other team members' ideas. But it's still the youth partner's job to really um, raise up that voice and their ideas. The youth partner should also be clear about what they will and will not be sharing with the youth parent, youth's parent and the team. So that's going to be most conversations concerning personal subjects and goals. Those will remain confidential between the young person and their youth partner, but issues of safety will likely need to be brought to the attention of the team. It's also important that the youth partner clarify their role with the young person and their parent, right, that they are mandatory reporters and that they have received specific training and certification for their role. Um, so some other successful strategies, the family partner did a great job of backing the youth partner up in clarifying and explaining their role as a youth partner, um, while at the same time providing perspective to the whole team as to how the family member, Sarah, was feeling, and using some of their own lived experience to do so, which was one of our other collaboration strategies we highlighted. So they still stood by their client and validated those feelings while kind of not throwing the other peer partner under the bus. Okay, so we're going to talk about some common challenges that, and other successful strategies to address them. Before we move on to that, I'd really like to highlight something about the clarity of the role for the youth partner and the family partner. Oftentimes, role clarity doesn't just include what the youth and family partner do for the youth and family, but how are they not going to um, do certain things too. So I know that in my experience as a youth partner, oftentimes I was expected to do things like report back to the team on things that the youth was doing, and that's not necessarily appropriate unless there's a safety concern. My job is not to paddle on the young person, it's merely to support them in communicating with their team and bringing their voice to the process. And I think that family partners are often put in that position as well, where they're expected to sort of provide an update on what the family member is thinking, rather than um, team members equally collaborating with youth and family. So I just wanted to highlight before we move on to the next topic. So common challenge number one, when a young person and their parent aren't on the same page. I know that folks that, um, often see this in wraparound. I know that I used to see it a lot when sometimes we were working on the family and youth vision or the team mission. Um, there was even one team that I worked with where we had sort of a separate vision for the youth and a separate vision for the family. And then as we worked through the wraparound process, they ended up becoming more aligned. 
But oftentimes, and I think that we see this with all families, not just families who are in wraparound, we see young people becoming more and more independent and oftentimes, um, I, I don't want to use the term rebelling, but just disagreeing with what their parent might want for them or expects of them. So I think that we can agree that this is particularly true with youth who are older, so 13 and above. We also start to see around that age uh, 13 and 14 in many states, that's where youth can start making independent decisions regarding their care, um, which is a tricky thing for both youth and families, right? Sometimes uh, uh, youth and parents feel at odds or like that team members are picking sides. I think uh, that all of us who have been around and wrap around have seen this before, where maybe the team will be a little bit more aligned with the young person or more aligned with the family member. This can be challenging for youth partners and family partners who are tasked with bringing the youth and family voice to the table, whether they agree with it or think it will cause conflict. So again, the role of the youth partner and the family partner is not to tell the young person or the family member what to do or what the team wants them to do, but rather to help bring their voice to the table. I once worked with a care coordinator who, when this would happen and folks were at odds, they called it the healthy tension. And I thought that that was a really good way to visualize it because what it meant was that we were actually doing an active job of bringing voices to the table, but then from there we needed to work on how are we going to honor both voices and have people become more aligned in the process. However, before we get there, this may result in escalation between the youth and the parents, and that might possibly, possibly cause tension between the youth partner and the family partner. So some strategies that we recommend in order to mitigate this that we've mentioned before is a positive and proactive communication. So working ahead of time with the youth and the parent to consider effective communication strategies, especially when you anticipate a topic that the young person or parent plans to raise at the meeting that may cause tension. So for instance, something that I frequently did with young people I was working with but I would not only talk with them about what they wanted to bring to the meeting, but I would ask them, okay, what do you think uh, some of your other team members are going to bring up? Or what do you think your parent or your guardian might bring up that is going to uh, possibly cause some tension or might make you upset? Then we were able to plan some strategies around what would happen in the meeting and also help the young person anticipate the situation to decide how they wanted to respond. Would that be with a negotiation? Would it be further explaining the point? Were there ways that they could explore some consequences or meet their parents in the middle? And oftentimes when I would have conversations like this with the young people, that was something that they were fine with me reporting back to the family partner. So the family partner could do some equal sort of preparation with the family member. It's always a good idea to help them practice sharing their ideas and anticipate how others might react. So do you think that folks are going to be angry? Who do you think is going to be an ally and support you? Things of that nature. And then of course, always helping the youth and the parents share their agenda items with the parent or the young person prior to the meeting. That was something that I know I learned the hard way <laughs> was when we're helping the young person um, or the family member prepare for the meeting and perhaps that these are folks who might be living under the same roof but don't understand or don't know what uh, uh, the priorities for the other might be. That's something where the youth partner and the family partner can really come in to help the youth and the family member explore how they want to effectively communicate their agenda items with their parents or with their child prior to the meeting. So of course when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you're really checking with the young person and the family member to share their agenda items with the family partner or the youth partner. This is a part of keeping it confidential. We always wanna honor the voice of the youth and the family that we are working with. 
and we don't want to push them to share anything that they're not comfortable doing right away. This is also something that we might be able to communicate with each other as youth partners or family partners, that there are certain things that, that the youth or the family doesn't want to share, so we're not going to share them with each other, but here are the things where they're willing to collaborate or the things that they want to um, bring up at, at their meeting or to each other. So our second common challenge that we want to highlight is when the team sides with either the youth or the family member. So sometimes there might be a strategy that is favored by the majority of the team that will not align with the desires of either the youth or the family, um, which in my experience is a lot of times not aligning with the desires of the young person. Um, and this can result in either the young person or the parent shutting down and not wanting to participate in the planning process. And this can usually kind of boil over over time. So some strategies to deal with this um, are really want to emphasize those themes of proactivity and preparation here, but emphasizing from the beginning that all ideas are valid, the youth and family are the best experts on their own lives, and that the plan is going to work better if everyone is on board, right? The young person is probably not going to go along with it if you're telling them that they have to get a job before they do whatever else it is that they're interested in doing. Um, and this is also where ground rules can go a long way. If you establish ground rules at the beginning that honor the voice of the youth and the parents and also emphasize um, respect and things like that, then you as the youth partner or the family partner can kind of direct the team back to that if something like this is occurring. Mm -hmm. Here again, you want to use positive and proactive communication um, when you're planning to present ideas to the team. Um, and also, as youth partner and family partner, this is where you can provide your own perspective on how the young person or family is feeling, um, especially when the youth is, you know, shutting down because maybe there is um, some alliances happening within the team or something like that. This is where the youth partner could say, you know, when I was a young person in the system, I know that it was really helpful for me to have a voice in my own plan if I was going to adhere to that plan or something like that. And if you don't mind me highlighting, Maria, really quick, just to hop in, I think that sometimes sure, that this is a lot of communication that's happening in between the meetings, right? So I know that I would often communicate with family partners about some of my own experience just so that they could really um, help the family member understand what it is that, that their young person might be feeling. Uh, again, I think a lot of these strategies are strategies that we're highlighting in between team meetings, not just during team meetings. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so common challenge number three, when youth and family members are in a consistent disagreement. We never see that, right? That never happens. <laughs> no, I'm joking, obviously. Um, so we know that wraparound is already sort of suggested for families and young people who might be experiencing some risk or some disagreement in the home. Oftentimes, it is difficult for youth and their parents to agree on strategies or sometimes even be in the same meeting together. Um, I, as a youth partner, once worked on a team with uh, an uh, adolescent who did not want to be in the same room with her father. And he was eventually, the plan was that he was going to be her permanent placement. So we had to come up with strategies that, so that uh, we could still have a planful meetings together. Um, and usually that was maybe her father would call in on the phone or maybe we'd even have separate meetings. But something that was really helpful on that team is that 
both myself and the family partner were at every single meeting. So whether the youth was there, whether the father was there, we attended all of them. And that way we were able to not only easily communicate with each other, but as a team that communicate, and when I say team, I sort of mean like the mini team of the youth partner and the family partner and the youth and the uh, parent, um, communicate together how we eventually wanted to come this um, and collaborate in a more planful way or figure out strategies that would work for them. Uh, so this is something that I don't think is uncommon for older youth and for families that we see who are going in the wraparound process. And it might be a slow going collaboration, but it's really important that we're walking alongside the youth and the family as we are helping them sort of be able to communicate with each other even when disagreement arises. So you might also want to help the youth and the parent consider some other unconventional proactive communication strategies. This can be letter writing, allowing the youth partner to share the perspective of the family partner, while of course keeping it confidential, only sharing things that the young person or the family member has said, yes, that's okay, you can share that. And then scheduling a meeting together, like I said, that mini team, at which the youth and the parents can share their perspectives while the youth partner and the family partner help facilitate. And it's in this perspective, the youth partner and the family partner are still there to help raise the voice of the youth and the family, even if they may be in disagreement, but also hold everybody accountable to our wraparound principles, right? So making sure that this is still a collaborative, strength-based process that, that is not um, turning into a venting session or things of that nature, but something that is really there so that we can figure out how to effectively communicate with one another. Also, it's important to keep in mind that there may be some unmet underlying needs that should be addressed as a part of this process. So think about really what is it to, that is not a quote solution or a service that is going to quote unquote fix the, the youth and the family, but what is the need that we are identifying that we can help them with so that they can become more aligned. Something that I often saw in the wraparound process is the youth and the family usually had the same vision, just different ideas on how to get there. And once we realize that that's the case so, or that um, they want the same need to be met, that makes it a lot easier to help young people and family members effectively communicate. We wanna make sure that we're not stoking any fires or any disagreement between the youth and the family, but rather helping them really identify what their long-term goals and visions are. And if they have different strategies to get there, that's okay. Let's see, let's throw it on the wall and see what sticks, right? But making sure that those are all honored. Okay, common challenge number four, when meetings become arguments or therapy sessions, another one that never happens. Uh-huh. <laughs> so this is something that can happen even with skilled facilitators, right? Um, like Caitlin said, wraparound is often recommended for families that are already experiencing some degree of tension or crisis in the home. So it can kind of be a breeding ground for these kind of tense meetings, right? So uh, this can happen due to disagreement. Um, some of the things we already highlighted where there can be a clash in vision, um, it could be due to crisis or just uh, different agendas of different team members and meetings can kind of go off the rails, right? Start to look like arguments, therapy sessions, lectures, and these lectures can often be directed at the young person. Maybe some of their old dirty laundry is being aired. Um, this is where it's a good strategy for the youth partner and the family partner to meet with each other before the meeting to discuss some of the potential pitfalls and any of the strategies that they're personally planning to support the youth and family if things get off track. Um, it's really important for the youth partner and the family partner to have an alliance on the team, right? They're, you're the two peer partners on the team, so 
um, it's good to have that kind of sense of backing each other up like we talked about earlier. And when things do get off track, you can kind of have each other's back. And um, in redirecting the team to the wraparound principles and any ground rules you hopefully established earlier, or, you know, maybe um, coming back with your clients, the youth and family, and saying, hey, things, you know, went off track. What are some ground rules we maybe need to establish for next time? So, yes, redirecting to the ground rules and, okay, like I just said, amending the ground rules after any issues as needed. And then, again, ensuring everyone is fully prepared before the meeting. Like Caitlin said, a lot of this work um, is really preventative work and doing that work between the meetings. So it could be some of those strategies like meeting together with the youth and family partner present or working on that proactive and positive communication, building those effective communication skills, asking those open-ended questions of, okay, what, what are the topics you want to raise? How do you think this person will react if they respond this way? How would you like to respond? Um, those kind of things. And then using the principle of keeping it confidential, um, but working to inform the care coordinator, um, the youth partner slash family partner, uh, what kind of things they can expect so everyone can be on the same page to the extent that's possible. Anything you want to add there, Caitlin? Yeah, something that I'd like to highlight is I do think that there were teams that I was a part of where having that peer alliance was also really good modeling for the youth and the family. Um, I, uh, I'm just remembering this now, but there was a team that I was on where the, youth, the family partner and I um, had a, a pretty good relationship. And so I think that in seeing this, the youth was kind of like, huh, it's interesting to me that Caitlin, somebody who has been a part of the system and who has had similar struggles that I have, and the family partner who is obviously has a peer alliance with my mom, can have such a strong relationship. So I'm not saying that y'all need to be best friends or anything, but sometimes that alliance can also, I think, uh, really be some good modeling for the youth and the family. Um, you know, of course, we don't want to, you know, create an idea that, like, we're, um, I don't know, it, it causing any risks or anything of that nature or, like, uh, creating uh, separate team alliances, uh, but Sometimes just that modeling of good relationship behavior for the young person and the family member when they're interacting or see their peers interacting, I think can be super helpful. Okay, so for our wrap up, our hot tips that we reviewed today, we're promoting positive and proactive communication. So this is really, helping the young person and the family member anticipate the situation and think about how do they want to communicate their needs or their strategies to not only their team members, but each other. And the way that we help do this as youth partners and family partners is we're not telling them what to do. We are using open-ended questions to actively elicit their voice. And then perhaps we're coming together as the youth partner and the family partner and saying, this is sort of the plan that the youth of the family would like to see. How do we want to go forward with this? So, um, and maybe coming up with some strategies of how to help them effectively communicate. Keeping it confidential. So we don't want to damage alliances, but we, with, and in order to do that, we want to make sure that we're checking in with the youth and the family about what it is that we can share as a youth partner or family partner, whether that be with the parents, the youth, the entire team, or with each other as peers. Um, and we might want to share uh, some things that, that uh, are just priorities for the youth and the family, and perhaps the things that are quote unquote confidential aren't really things that we're addressing in the wraparound meeting anyway. Now, of course, in the keeping it confidential bucket, we want to make sure that we are still reporting anything that is a safety issue. 
um, as mandatory reporters. So if a young person or a family member is being abused or abusing others, or perhaps if a young person is uh, having thoughts of suicide or hurting themselves, those are always things that we would report. But perhaps there are things that we're working on with the youth and the family that just aren't really that relevant to the wraparound process, but they would rather not have a share. Then providing perspective. So again, this is including things like sharing your own experience so that folks really understand maybe where the young person or the family member is coming from. And so uh, that might be something where as a youth partner, you're sharing that with a family partner so that they can then share that with the parents, perhaps vice versa. Or maybe we're sharing, I know that there's a number of times where I would be in team meetings and sort of reflect a little bit on my experience so, so that people understood the desires or the behaviors of the young person. And then as always, clarifying the roles. So making sure that folks understand and that youth and parents understand that the role of the youth partner and the family partner is to help bring youth voice and family voice to the forefront of the wraparound planning process. This doesn't mean that we're telling the young person or the family member what to do. We are not there as advocates for other team members or trying to convince them to do certain things. And there might be things that they are sharing with us that are not relevant for the wraparound process. A part of creating that peer alliance is making sure that we have mutual respect and we're not quote unquote just reporting back to team members we're really um, making sure that we are honoring youth and family voice. Okay, I think that we are ready to go ahead and look at questions. So it looks like we have a number of questions in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry, um, I, forgot to, I forgot to take myself off of mute. Uh, so here's a question I've been monitoring. Here's one that came early on. Um, can you please clarify what you mean by issues of safety necessitating a breach of confidence versus man issues mandating a report to Child Protective Services? Certainly, yeah. So when we're talking about issues of safety, what we're really focusing on is, that, again, if parents or young people are being abused or being abusive. Um, additionally, if the, the young person maybe shares with their youth partner that they are thinking of hurting themselves um, or experiencing feelings of suicidality, those are things that we should be really clear with the young person in the beginning that uh, we will be there to help them, but we're going to have to report that back to folks. Um, now, we might have young people who are engaging in risky behavior. So as we mentioned with our previous scenario, um, yeah, that might be something that comes up. And when that's happening, it's not necessarily our job as a youth partner to go on tell on the youth, right? What we're going to do is help them really explore consequences and then also try and help them think about what are some other goals maybe or something like that perhaps that they want to work on. Now in the previous example that we brought up, that behavior was actually that the youth wanted to access birth control, which we could argue is actually um, a good self-determination skill. You know, they're planning ahead, they're trying to take care of their health, uh, and if the youth partner didn't share that with a team member because it wasn't something that necessarily was unsafe, right? It was just something with a family member disagreed with. So when we're talking about safety, I think that we're really talking about um, are people being abused or abusive? Are people having some sort of mental health crisis where there needs to be an intervention? Um, or are people thinking of hurting themselves? Does that help answer the question?
Okay, do we have any other questions here? We received a number of questions about the availability of the slides um, and the recording. And everybody that's registered should receive information about the recording of the webinar when it's available. Um, additionally, I posted several times into the chat box um, a, a web address where you can look at the publications that we have that cover uh, virtually all of the information that we've been talking about today. So that can be a different kind of record of today's conversation. So here's a couple more questions. Um, is there anything you would add for strategies as the wraparound facilitator to best work with the family partner in the youth peer support? Yeah, I think that it's really important that not only youth and family partners are well aligned, but that we're planning well with the care coordinator too. I think the teams that I was on that I found to be the most, uh, um, where the process that I think went the most smoothly uh, was where we were, again, doing that preparation with the, the youth and the family. And it was always really helpful when we were preparing for a team meeting to have the care coordinator there and to really have them also actively eliciting what were things that the youth wanted to talk about during the team meeting and making sure that there weren't any surprises, right? Um, I think also it's always helpful for me as a youth partner when care coordinators are doing that with other team members so that I can help prepare the youth for anything that might come up. Uh, I was on a team one time where uh, the young person, it was their second team meeting and uh, they were in foster care and their case manager brought up in the meeting that they were going to be removing them from a family member's home that day, uh, which uh, obviously didn't go super well. And the care coordinator shared with me afterwards that this was a surprise to them. Um, nobody appreciated this coming up in the meeting. And so I think the more that we can actively plan with other team members and make sure that there are no surprises too, that's always very helpful. And something I know that was helpful for me was that when um, care coordinators were flexible to sort of uh, uh, editing the meetings, if you would, to help meet the needs of the young person. Um, so another example that I have is I was working with a young person who it was just really uncomfortable for her when we would all go around and share what we thought her strengths were. Um, so, uh, as sort of an accommodation for that, uh, she and I talked about it, and what she wanted was that we would create, like, little flashcards or postcards that people could go and write uh, something that they think is going well, and then any suggestions or strategies for her, and she could take those with her after the meeting and look at them. Um, so, I think when care coordinators are excited and open to strategies like that that make meetings just a little bit more bearable for the young person or the family member, that's always great. Okay, so there have been a number of questions for people, um, I think, who want more information about the youth peer support role and the family peer support role, um, some more sort of basic information. So I would encourage you for that um, to visit the two, two websites, um, and I'll put them into the chat in a minute. Um, for general family peer support, we have a number of resources on the website of the National Wraparound Initiative. Um, and for uh, youth peer support, I think uh, there's some on the NWI website as well as on our Pathways Research and Training Center websites. I think there's uh, quite a bit you can gain there. And I would say that also by signing up for the um, email information, the list serves on each of those websites, then you'll get information coming into your inbox about any future events and also products related to these um, two themes. So um, I was going to, let's see, we have some more questions here. Um, I like the idea of youth and family partners working together to ensure perspectives are shared in wraparound. How would you recommend setting that up with a youth and a parent so they are aware that peers will be talking in this way outside of meetings? That's a great question. So uh, when I would first meet with young people and uh, talk about my role, 
I would also make sure to let them know, like, there is an equivalent of this uh, for your parents. And sometimes we like to talk to each other so that we can best support you guys. But again, one of our strategies is keep it confidential. So I always told the young person, if there is anything that you don't want me to share, I'm not going to share it unless, of course, it's a safety issue. Additionally, I'll check with you before I share anything with a family partner. Um, and I would remind them too, like if you change your mind or something of that nature, that's totally fine. So I think having that transparency and then also letting the young person know that it's up to them what I'm going to be sharing was always really helpful. Okay, so here's another question, sort of uh, with a similar theme in a way. How do you balance confidentiality with the motto, quote, there, there's no secrets in wraparound? Yeah, I read that. I thought that, that was interesting. Um, so that's something, Laura, uh, I don't know if you would like to speak about this after, but I've never heard that there's no secrets in wraparound. Um, wraparound is not about having all of the information about the youth and the family. In fact, uh, I find that to be a little voyeuristic. Um, just because a young person or a family member is receiving services doesn't mean that we get to know everything in their business all of the time. They are their own autonomous individuals who get to make decisions outside of the wraparound process, right? Um, our job as wraparound team members is to help them identify needs that they want to work on and that they want to identify strategies for and then we can um, help them do that. But one of our first principles is being youth and family driven. And I think that that means if there are things that the youth and the family member don't wanna share with us that aren't related to their wraparound plan, that's totally fine. That's their, their personal business. Um, I think that going back to the example about uh, uh, that we brought up earlier, um, when the young person asks their youth peer support partner to help them get birth control, a need that wasn't related to a need on the wraparound plan. And in fact, like I said, it was actually, I think, a good self-determination skill that helps the young person um, identify how to take care of their health and reach out for support. Um, so I think it's important for us to remember not everything that a young person family does is going to be a part of our plan. Um, in fact, I would imagine as a young person who's been through the system uh, and who has felt myself like people were talking about me or like needing to know everything about me, I think that we should actually encourage that young people and family members get to have personal lives that we don't need to know about. Um, yeah, I hope that that helps answer that. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on being a peer partner to a young person with a developmental delay or disability? Uh, I definitely work with young people with developmental delays, just sometimes that your strategies might look a little bit different when you're working with them. Um, and also, generally, the relationships that they have with their parents is going to look a little bit different. So some of the strategies that you work with with family partners that um, might be different, too. Um, yeah, Maria, do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, no, I think you're right on that. You just need to adjust your strategies and... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say sometimes I know for me, um, and I want to highlight I am not an expert in working with you who have developmental delays. I've just done so before. But just sometimes that maybe things that are a little bit more direct. You're still not telling the young person what to do. Um, and you are having uh, um, different kinds of conversations to make sure that their voice comes to the team meeting. Um, but I would say that certainly young people with developmental delays and disabilities can work with peer partners. Yeah, it's hard to say because developmental disability is just such a broad category. So, um, I mean, I think it's important to still get to know, you know, that young person on an individual basis because there could be a whole range of strategies depending on um, their individual needs, you know. 
So it seems that um, the issue of sort of confidentiality keeps coming up again and again. I think this is very interesting. So here's another question. Um, may uh, require a little interpretation, but the question is, how do I advocate for the family partner and youth partner role implementation on a team that isn't transparent with case information, but wants to know the work I do with families? Oh, man. Oh, man. I, <laughs> um, I will say it's sort of a slow, ongoing process, and I think uh, one of the difficult things about being up here is that oftentimes that your role isn't just about working in, with individual work, youth and families, it's about promoting a culture shift within agencies, right? Um, and that's hard. I mean, we're not just advocating for what individual youth and family needs, but we're advocating for a shift where, again, it's not like providers get to know everything about the personal lives of youth and families. And I think that it's a part of really promoting that shift of youth and families being their own best experts rather than providers needing to gather all of this information in order to tell them what to do. And so I think that I know for me when I was working as a youth partner, it took a lot of providing my own perspective, my own lived experience on how systems uh, um, would make me feel sort of less than or very isolated in order for providers to understand that it's really not their role and it's not relevant for them to know everything about what you're doing with the youth and the family member. And just because there might be conversations or things that you're having with them outside of the wraparound process doesn't mean that uh, um, anything bad is happening. I think sometimes teens worry that there's sort of like a risk, right? Um, yeah, I hope that that helps answer. Would you add anything to that, Maria? Sorry, no, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, I think I think that covers it great. All right. Well, I apologize for my dog barking. That was the mail. Um, another question: What if a youth isn't responsive or talkative during meetings? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, Janet. Can you repeat it? What if a youth is not responsive or talkative during meetings? I think that that's really where the preparation piece to help come in. So uh, I had a number of youth where, especially when I would first start working with them, because oftentimes I would be assigned a young person where the wraparound process has already been happening for a little while. Uh, who either didn't want to attend their meetings, uh, would shut down, um, really didn't want to be there. And so I would prepare with the youth and say, tell me what it is you don't like about your meetings and tell me some strategies for making it better. The thing that I heard the most was that youth often felt like they were being lectured or that we were talking about things that were in the past, um, things that they felt like weren't relevant anymore and they were just sort of being berated for their past behaviors. Um, so youth and I would work together to set up things like ground rules uh, that we could talk about in the meeting and redirect team members to. Um, honestly, some really common ones were things like don't air dirty laundry. Um, another that I would frequently um, help identify with youth that was don't talk about the young person, like they're not there, talk directly to them. Um, also, sometimes you can get really creative just to make meetings more fun. I had a staff member one time who they were working with a young person who was really into baby goats. And so they had a ground rule where the young person could pause the meeting once during the meeting anytime and show everybody a YouTube video of a baby goat. So I think that there are some things where we can really work with young people to identify what's going to be better for them, what do they prioritize, and how do we want to bring that to the table. Oftentimes, too, I found that young people who were shutting down during meetings felt like the topics that we were talking about just weren't relevant to what they wanted. So making sure that we work with youth ahead of time and then talk with the care coordinator and the family member about that, about what the youth wants to talk about at their team meetings is super helpful. Um, and then also coming back to that, making sure that 
uh, all team members that um, understand that there shouldn't be any surprises. So if there's anything that's going to be contentious that's coming up at the meeting, as the youth partner or the family partner, it's really good to let us know beforehand so that we can work with the youth and the family on that and help them anticipate the situation and prepare for how they want to respond to that within the meeting. So we have another question that I think revolving around confidentiality and whether the young person's drug and alcohol use would be something that would um, be reportable or would lead to uh, breaking confidentiality. I think that that's something that depends a, a bit on the severity, right? Or maybe also the legal circumstances for the young person. Um, an example that I can give uh, that I hope is helpful is that I was working with a young person once who they were on probation. Um, and so obviously as a part of probation, you get regular drug tests and they came to me and they said that they had smoked marijuana um, and they knew that they were gonna be busted and they were really worried. So before going and like, uh, quote unquote, tattling on the young person, what I did was actively help them think about like, okay, well, let's explore the consequences here. So uh, we know that you're gonna test positive anyway. What do you think would be some good ways to help mitigate the situation? And we ended up identifying strategies about how they would effectively communicate with their parents and with their parole officer in order to um, kind of, a, get ahead of things, but also I think B, the youth felt better taking some accountability. So my recommendation for that is, again, working with the young person so that they can kind of take control for themselves. Um, but obviously if we're getting into a region where a young person is doing really serious drugs or at real serious risk for their safety, that's probably going to look different. So there have been several questions uh, for people who are interested in knowing about whether there is some kind of um, participant um, certificate or letter or CME, and I don't think so, but I'm going to ask Nicole to please post something in the chat about that, if it, uh, whether or not it's available. Um, so here's another question, very timely. I am still adjusting to facilitating digital wrap meetings and there's quite a learning curve. Do you have any specific strategies or pitfalls that you have encountered with B? Um, I haven't encountered that as I haven't participated in a digital wrap meeting, but one thing that Maria and I have been hearing a lot about, uh, because we do some communities of practice for youth peers, which if anybody is interested in that, please uh, get in touch for that as well. Uh, is that sometimes that young people, and I probably family members, I would imagine that this is true for too, don't necessarily feel comfortable sitting like in the same room right next to each other uh, with the rest of the team online. So again, I think my, the best recommendation I can think of for that is really getting into some of the preparation. So as a youth partner, I would ask the young person like, uh, where do you wanna be in the house when you're having this meeting? Um, do you wanna be at the same table with your parent or do you wanna be in your bedroom? How do you like to communicate with me during meetings? Because something that is pretty common for youth partners and family partners is we will you know, sit next to the youth or the family member and kind of um, maybe have some side conversations to ourselves or I know like I would have youth write me notes and stuff like that if they didn't feel comfortable speaking up for themselves. So as a youth partner, I would likely ask the young person, like uh, if there's something that you wanna bring up but don't feel comfortable doing it in that moment, um, how do you wanna communicate that with me? How do you wanna be talking back and forth? Uh, but yeah, I think that that's a really timely question and uh, we're all trying to figure that out a little bit. But I think that again, just the, uh, I can't uh, highlight the importance of preparation enough. I think that that's really, really helpful. Thanks, Caitlin. And just to clarify, uh, no, there are not uh, certificates or CEUs, unfortunately, available for this webinar. I just had confirmation from Nicole. Um, here's another question. 
how do you handle a team where the youth doesn't engage with the youth peer partner or doesn't want them included, but the team wants them involved? So I want to just go back to our first principle of being youth and family driven. If the, the young person doesn't want a youth peer partner, I don't think that it's appropriate for us to force it on them. I also might think about, like, ask the young person themselves, what is it that they don't want about the youth peer? Is it just that they don't want a new, another professional on their team? Is it that the, they're just not well aligned with the youth peer, and perhaps if there was another person available, would they feel more comfortable with them? Um, but if a young person is advocating that they don't want a youth peer on the team, then I think that we need to honor that young person's voice. I think sometimes, just to add to that, there are situations um, that you encounter where um, the youth feels, and possibly rightly, that the young adult peer partner has is sort of being pressured to convince the youth of certain things. Can you speak that uh, to that, uh, Caitlin? I think that might also affect engagement. Sure. I mean, so I think a lot of the times what we encounter, again, is uh, um, youth peers or young people or even team members kind of having that lack of role clarity. And that's one of the strategies that we had really hit on. And so we want to make sure that everybody on the team and the youth peer understands themselves that a part of their job isn't to be advocates for the team members. It's not to convince youth to do a certain thing or to, um, you know, lecture the youth or things of that nature. It's to really create a mutuality with the young person so that they can actively understand what it is that they want to bring to the team. Um, so if youth are feeling like a, a provider, and I think this goes for any provider, is trying to tell them what to do, what a turn off. I mean, I know that we've all been young people before, regardless if we've been young people in systems, and I doubt, I've never met a person who is like, I love being told what to do when I was a young adult. Um, so if we have a youth peer who is doing that and is sort of a, like there to be the voice for the team, that's, a, that's the antithesis of what they should be doing. So we want to make sure that they really understand their role and are able to provide that role clarity to the team and to the young person so that the young person understands that this is somebody who's there to make sure that their voice is a part of their planning process. And this question asks uh, similarly about a family partner, but I, I do feel that the issues are largely the same. And um, I think that uh, some of these can be addressed by some building kind of an organizational awareness or within your wraparound program about the roles of youth and family partner, maybe getting some more uh, additional training and also perhaps some skills training for the youth and family partners themselves. Um, so here's another fairly practical question. How do you go about updating the RAP coordinator after meeting one-on-one -on -one with the young person? So that's a great question. So I think, again, making sure that you're really clear with the young person that there are certain things that, that like, might be good for them to share. So, like, things that they want on their agenda or things that they want to be working on. And, again, always checking with the young person. I would always ask them, like, is it cool with you if I share this with the care coordinator? And I would ask them how they would want it to be shared. So I might say something like, do you want to tell them or do you want me to tell them? Because um, that's always great when youth are building that self-determination where they reach out to the care coordinator themselves. And they're like, hey, this is what I want, right? That's what we're trying to get to with youth and families. Um, but a lot of the times, yeah, youth would just say like, okay, yeah, that's cool. You can share that with them. But so, and that's a part of that keeping it confidential piece is making sure that you're checking in with the young person about what it is that they want to have shared. And I think that even when we're just asking that pretty regularly and checking in with a young person about that, what we're really showing them is that we value their voice and that this is their process. This is not us telling them what to do or telling them that they're wrong or trying to direct them in a certain way. This is us saying, how do you want this to go? What do you want out of this? Um, so yeah, I really think it's as simple as checking in and being like, okay, cool. Can I share that with your peer coordinator, Bob? Or do you want to share that with them? Um, is a good effective strategy. 
If the youth does not want a peer partner or if a peer partner isn't available, how could a family partner engage the youth or help feel more comfortable with a peer partner? Well, I think we've kind of covered that second part. So what about having a family partner step in? Okay, so this might be a little blunt, you guys, and I apologize if it, um, it feels a little harsh, but I really, really, really um, discourage folks from having a family partner work with the youth or vice versa. And the reason being is I think that this uh, creates a significant challenge in the peer alliance for the family member or for the young person. Um, I know that there was a time where I was on a team where the, uh, the family member did not like their family partner, so, you know, quote, unquote, fired their family partner and then was trying to utilize me in that role. And it was not appropriate and very difficult because it made the young person feel like that it was causing harm in our alliance and, like, people were teaming up against her. So I know it's super hard when there's not a peer partner available. It sucks. And that's the situation for a lot of communities. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily the best organizationally or for promoting that role clarity. If we suddenly have a family partner working with both a family member and a youth or vice versa. Um, I might explore other uh, resources in your community or in the young person's community. So, for instance, I know, um, I can give a, a real life example. I know as a youth partner, if uh, my quote unquote caseload, I don't love that word, but if my caseload was full and I had staff members who were in the same situation, um, I would actually bring young people, I would still meet with them, you know, maybe once or twice, and I would bring them to the drop in center that Maria operated where you could come and go and receive support. So maybe Maria, you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think that is a good option that might um, be for young people who feel that having a youth partner in wraparound is a little bit too like service oriented or like kind of feels like a little bit coercive for back, lack of a better word, and also be a good option for youth who are still interested in peer services after they are um, closing wraparound but still need um, that peer support or interested in receiving peer support in a way that's not tied to wraparound. Mm -hmm. Um, so, how can we respond and support youth and families when a surprise does occur? And I'm assuming this means maybe in the meeting. Difficult topics may lead to other challenges that we were not prepared for. A youth or care group, uh, caregiver may bring something up that is contentious. So, in terms of supporting youth and family members when a surprise does occur, um, I think that I know with young people where I've had that happen, making sure that we're checking in after the meeting. You know, maybe that's directly after, or maybe that's, you know, a day later or something of that nature, but definitely checking in with them, sort of getting their perspective on what happened, normalizing any feelings that they might have about it. And then again, trying to use open-ended questions to really actively get their opinion or get their perspective on how they want to handle the situation from there. Um, but again, I think that, and surprises will happen, but all of the preparation that we can do is really gonna be helpful. How could youth and family partners explain their role to the agency they work for to understand the difference between life experience and a college degree as far as pay grade? Oh, that's a juicy one. <laughs> well, something that I think is helpful is to always have a tool, especially when you're with agency members. And lucky for you, if you go to the Pathways website that uh, Janet has posted to all participants, we do have a tool up there that says what is and is not a youth peer support. And I think that that can be really helpful for people to understand exactly how it is that youth peer support engage with young people and bring their voice to the meeting. And it also shares a little bit about what youth peer support should not be expected to do. 
Now, when it comes to college degrees, I think that that's a, there's a lot wrapped up in there, right? One is a stigma. And so as these peer support specialists and family support specialists, a lot of the time our job is not just to support individualized youth and families, but to really be that advocate for culture change. And a part of that is that I have expertise in an area that is just as valid as clinical expertise might be. Um, and I think it's really important to, that that's something that we continue to advocate and highlight for, and also identify those allies within our agencies who really understand that and sort of talk to them about how they might be able to talk with colleagues as well. Um, because that a, it's a big culture shift for us to uh, understand that lived experience is a different kind of expertise, but is just as valid as a clinical background. And I would also bring it back to that whole, if we're going to be youth and family driven, we need to believe that youth and families are their own best experts. We have experts in lived experience, the you know, clinician or care coordinator or whoever has expertise in certain areas as well, but we're all equally bringing that to the table. So actually, um, that pretty much brings us to the end of the questions, unless somebody's going to type one in there into the box in the next 30 seconds. While I thank our presenters, um, you guys did a great job and really what an excellent set of questions. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that it would be very nice to turn those questions into another just sort of a brief uh, resource document. So uh, we may be doing that and posting it on Pathways um, in the near future. So I do not see any further questions. So once again, I want to thank everyone. Um, and I hope that you have an excellent rest of your day.